I worked at a foie gras farm for four months and witnessed the whole process, from gathering the eggs to slaughter. The days were long and labor intensive, and the cruelty I witnessed was horrendous. Before I started, I had heard of the cruelties of foie gras production, but I also heard that these claims were exaggerated or false. After the first few days of working, it was crystal clear that the production of foie gras is inherently cruel. The best way to maximize profits is to get the biggest and hence the most diseased liver. As my supervisor stated, the point of gavage is to make a duck as sick as possible, to bring them to the brink of death. Every Thursday, I would work at the hatchery. I would help remove the day-old ducks from the incubator cabinets. Once all the ducks were removed, the hatchery worker would sex the ducks, throwing the male ducks into a basket in front of me and throwing the female ducks into another basket or sometimes directly into a garbage bag. My job was to detow the males. This was done using regular household scissors and I was instructed to not only cut the nail since it would simply regrow, but to cut the entire region where the nail protruded from. The female ducks would be thrown into the garbage, and when the garbage bag was one half to three quarters full, the bag would be closed, and depending on who was working, they would either be gassed with carbon dioxide, or the bag would simply be tied shut without any gas whatsoever. The reason that females are thrown out is because their livers are wrapped in veins, affecting the quality of their liver. The sex ratio of born ducks is about 55% male and 45% female, which means we were throwing away approximately 1,000 female ducks per week. Later, we would rip open the garbage bags and shake out all the baby ducks into the bins designed for animal carcasses. On every occasion, there would be live ducklings thrown into the garbage. Sometimes I observed only one or two live ducks, but sometimes almost every duck seemed to be alive. Opening the garbage bin, it would not be uncommon to see the whole top layer of day-old ducks peeping and moving about. Sometimes the baby ducks would be alive the next day. Every time we went to get the ducks, at least one or two ducks would be deemed too small and would be killed. One of the workers had told me we didn't take the small ducks because their livers would not grow large enough anyway. One worker seemed to do it more often, and it seemed to me he would search out small ducks just so that he could kill them. He would hold them by the legs and wings upside down and swing them like a cricket bat against a wall. One day we brought back five ducks that were too small and one of the workers killed them by bashing their heads against concrete posts while the rest of us unloaded the other ducks. On another occasion, the supervisor told us not to load two ducks that were singled out in the back of the shed in transport cages and he told us to kill them. The worker asked if I wanted to kill them but I said no and he said, we'll kill one each. He took the first duck put it on the floor, stepped on his back, and grabbed the duck by the head and neck and twisted it several rotations. The duck convulsed and was flapping his wings, so the worker then kicked the duck, who ended up being kicked into the waste pit, where he continued to convulse. He told me to kill the next duck, but I said I was not comfortable. So he grabbed the duck and again stepped on the duck's back and twisted the neck several rotations. This time he backed up and said with a laugh that he had ripped off the duck's head. I went over to look, and saw that the head had been ripped off and was hanging attached to the body only by a single thread of tissue. I kept saying how it was gross, and the worker just laughed and would tell me, don't worry, it's dead. Sometimes we would bring back more ducks than we needed, and if it was only one or two extra, we would kill one or two of the smaller ducks. Often this was done by bringing the duck outside to the back of the shed, and a worker would either bash the duck's head against the wall, or sometimes, with an overhead swing, bash the duck against the ground. The ducks never died immediately. I would have to pick up the ducks and while still convulsing, throw them into the garbage bin on top of the other dead ducks. The garbage bins were always overflowing with the bodies of dead ducks. When we brought the month old quarantined ducks from the quarantine to a raising shed, they would be handled very roughly. At the raising shed, we would get on the cages, open the doors and grab the ducks to throw them down a ramp. Because they were thrown around, many ducks broke their legs and wings. At 12 weeks old, the ducks were ready to begin the cycle of force feeding or gavage. To gather the ducks, we would back the truck to the doors of the barn and create an enclosure with plywood and spare cages. 
Once ready, three or four of us would get behind the ducks and herd them toward the enclosure. When the ducks stopped moving or were moving slowly, workers would scream and lose their tempers. I saw on numerous occasions workers who would kick with all their force a duck so hard that the duck would be launched through the air 15 or 20 feet. Ducks at the rear of the flock would be picked up by the necks, heads, or wings and thrown toward the enclosure, sometimes 20 or 30 feet away. The workers in the enclosure would pick up two ducks at a time by one wing and lift them to the workers on the truck. While grabbing the ducks by the wings, you could feel and hear crushing noises, and sometimes you could even feel the wing pop out of the socket. We would put seven ducks per cage, which was a very tight fit, and the cage door usually had to be slammed shut, usually on the duck. The feeding sheds housed around 1,000 ducks. A duck would be put into a top closing wire cage with only their neck and head protruding. This made it easier to grab the ducks by their head to extend their necks in order to shove in the metal feeding rod. The machine was on wheels and would get pulled down the line of ducks. We would grab their heads in one hand, squeezing to open their beaks, and a metal rod that was attached to the machine would be shoved about 12 inches down their throats. I was told the reason we force fed the ducks was to induce a liver disease where the liver gets huge and fatty. We were rewarded for increasing the size of their livers as big as possible. The notion that the ducks enjoyed or looked forward to their force feeding is utterly ridiculous. As soon as the ducks received their dose, they would frantically shake their head from side to side, trying to spit out the food and often vomiting. The ducks would have trouble breathing pretty soon after feeding began. I was told that this was because we were increasing the size of their insides, which would push up against the lungs. Near the end of the force feeding cycle, breathing became very laborious for the ducks. During the last few days, most ducks could not even lift their heads and every day for the last few days, many ducks would die. It was not uncommon during the last few days to have six or seven dead ducks after a single feeding. At the slaughterhouse, we would unload the cages of ducks and we would be there for about 15 minutes. During this time, I would go over to the slaughtering area to see how it was done. The ducks would be grabbed from their cage and hung by their legs upside down on a sort of conveyor belt system. About 20 feet down the line, the ducks were supposed to go through an electrical bath, which was supposed to render them unconscious. I stood directly in front of this bath and saw that the overwhelming majority of birds would lift their necks, missing the bath completely. The slaughterer would grab the upside down duck by the head and puncture the jugular, causing him to bleed to death. The conscious ducks, and again, most of the ducks entirely missed the bath, which was only a few feet across, would flap their wings violently, squirm and thrash about. 